in one of um, Krishnamurti's journals, he uh, described what he thought to be the best way to look at what meditation really is. And he said it was like, just to be vulnerable. Now just, just imagine that, that meditation is just to be vulnerable, just to be sensitive. Like that new green leaf that was born yesterday to face rain, wind, darkness, and light. And re reminding us all that we take birth into this extraordinary vulnerable body. It's like um, each sense door is so sensitive that sensitivities, the Buddha called the six sense doors, doors, they're open like the eye has a hole in it, the ear has a hole in it, the skin has holes in it, <laughs> the mind door, the heart mind is a huge hole, <laughs> the biggest one of all. It's boundless, the, the nose, the mouth. It's, we don't usually get taught the level of vulnerability that we're born into. And because we're not given a training to even understand that when we're asked to be mindful of a sound, that we're actually asking you to connect your attention with the speed of sound. We're actually asking you to connect your attention with it and to, to um, receive it, receive the vibration texture and then to sustain the attention with the speed of sound and to notice the sound disappear, which is the easiest of them all. The speed of light is much faster. The speed of body sensations appearing and dis disappearing, the elements, what we call my body, the speed of the arisings and passings of the elements are faster so it's harder, right, to connect the attention, sustain it with the experience right as it's happening, not how we think it should be, and to see it disappear. This uh, takes uh, an enormous amount of um, the simplicity, the simplicity of connecting and sustaining, connecting and sustaining with what is true, with what is real. And so when we shift to thoughts and emotions, it's important to realize that thoughts are moving much faster. I mean, how in inconceivable is it? Sometimes a few people said today, boy, this seems impossible. But yeah, it does seem impossible sometimes to connect the attention, sustain it, with even seeing a thought vanish, never mind that most of the time we're remembering it, it already vanished, or we're remembering the sound, it already vanished. And then when we shift to, well, what is a thought? You know, not our thought about the thought, but what is, what does it look like? Well, is it the sound of your voice? Is it the sound of someone else's voice? Is it visual? Is it black and white? Is it color? It's just um, the exploration into just what thought is in the moment is so vast. And then often we will get these repeating thoughts, which, which again, there's a kind of vulnerability that happens where we think, oh, why does this keep repeating? Well, often there's an emotion underneath it that wants our attention. It's literally just wants our attention. And so the story will keep repeating and repeating until finally we go, oh, oh, I'm sad. You know, it's like, oh, anger, whatever. It's like, oh, happiness, oh, 
you know, <laughs> it could be that we're planning something to do because something was so pleasant, right? It's like we might plan how to do our next sitting because the sitting before was pleasant. So it's, it's um, the realization of um, the lack of training we had when we were young to understand this vulnerability, the six sense doors, and that anything can happen at any moment, at any of the sense doors, a smell, a taste, a touch, a thought, a body sensation, a sound, a thought, you know, this, um, that we really never know what's going to happen next. This is vulnerable. This is sensitive. Not to mention that with each moment of consciousness, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, there's a pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone, vedana, um, that is also uncontrollable. Each, check it out. There might be a pleasant thought, then an unpleasant uh, physical sensation, and then an unpleasant sound, a pleasant sound. It's like, and it's happening so fast. Um, it often takes some uh, training to be able to bring our attention to something steady and more neutral that can just calm the attention, that we can come to some kind of stillness so that we can um, see clearly the vulnerability that we're all born into. What is often ironic is that when we come to meditation, we're often wanting to genuinely um, get rid of our controlling nature and the controlling natures of others. But actually, when we, when we practice, when we bring our attention, say, to kind of the standard, let's go to the breath, probably over 90% of the people, when they bring their attention to the breath, when they start meditation, what do they see? They see that we're trying to control it. And then even if we bring it to sound, eventually there'll be some way that we will want to control it or whatever. It's like emotion or body sensations. What we are meant to see in Vipassana is the level of profound uh, change that we're born into, sensitivity, and that the knee-jerk reaction, the, the conditioning, is to try to protect ourselves from it with aversion and attachment. And we're, that, of course, we have to keep remembering to say, well, of course I don't want this pain, or I, of course I want that pleasure, uh, that that would be um, the knee-jerk response. And this is what the Buddha was so... Uh, I would say emphatic with it, we can liberate ourselves right there, right there with this gradual acceptance of the range of pleasure, pain, neutral feeling, with the range of um, the uncontrollability. That we can learn to, to see that it's not personal. It's how life is. This morning, I had an a amazing conversation with my neighbor. I've lived in this place almost 10 years, and I am sad to say I don't know my neighbors to my right. And um, since I've lived here, these weed trees have been coming into the um, grass. It's a desert, but these weed trees are coming in that are from most people's standards, quite ugly. <laughs> it's hard to find like some kind of aesthetic beauty in them. I try really hard. Um, I keep thinking maybe when they're 30 feet tall, they're going to be nice, but they're, they've just kind of come in, and anytime there's even the slightest rain, they grow, and it's, it really feels like pretty soon it's going to be a, a forest of these um, 
almost unacceptable trees. Uh, but they're just coming in and they're very hard to get out. Like if you don't pull it right at the moment it's born practically, they just get big really quick and really deep rooted. They're amazing actually, they're sur they can survive. Uh, and my neighbor doesn't have any. And my neighbor keeps getting them out. Like, and it's like, it's a big yard. And um, today, yet again, I'm watching him getting them out. And I look at his yard and my job, yard, you know, comparing mine, right? And I haven't talked to them, but it's great. He's down by the road where uh, I'm walking. And I had the most wonderful conversation with him because I found out kind of where we live, my yard and his yard are pretty free of these weed trees compared to other yards. And he had sheep for 10 years. It's amazing out in the desert for 10 years there. That's, and he used to um, put them on the yard that I live at. Um, you know, he, the neighbors, the people that own the, the yard that I live in now had him bring the sheep over. Um, and his wife doesn't want him to have the sheep anymore even though he does. So it was quite interesting to just see how there's this whole um, ecosystem that has happened in both of our yards that I had no idea about. And I've really, um, there's so much that I could share just about this story, but that sense of um, interest in these trees and an interest in how it's unfolding, the difference in his yard and, and over here in my garden. Uh, when I'm traveling and so busy, I don't, I don't even get to talk to my neighbor. You know, when I'm traveling and busy, I just feel like um, I barely get to notice these things. And to know that there were sheep on this um, land for 10 years, is a, it's amazing. But I can see that for me, the um, a, a amount of area in the yard that I'm going to be able to manage these trees is very small. And that the amount of area that he can manage is very big. So I joked with him about it. And he said, oh, don't worry. Nature's going to take over. Nature's in charge. I, these trees are going to come into my yard. I'm just kind of, he said, I'm actually, um, home i'm not working i'm bored i i just ha want something to do and i'm enjoying it you know so again it's like the differences in how our lives are um and it was so beautiful when he said oh michelle nature's gonna take it over it's okay the sheep are gone so sometimes when we're sitting the sixth sense door, moment to moment awareness, is saying, oh, it's okay, nature is in charge. Let me just see what will happen, right? Let me just see what's really happening at the sixth sense doors, moment to moment, without any agenda or any expectation or any idea of what good practice is. Just letting it all go, letting all these ideas of go just to be vulnerable just letting it flow and whether you're walking or sitting or eating see how long you can maintain that with some humor it might be three seconds it might be five seconds but often you'll find that you just are coming back from thinking you didn't see that you lost the flow of sixth sense door but and you didn't see that you missed the thought you just find you come back and it takes a lot of resilience and humor to just jump back in that flow and know that you're going to get lost in thought you know you will and how much Think about how much courage that takes to, to be willing to get lost, to be willing moment by moment to go into the unknown. And th this is something we, if we know that's what's happening, if we know how much courage this takes, if we understand that each moment is new, 
it really is it's like i'm not making it up the buddha didn't make it up it's like each moment at one of the sense sense doors arises and passes awareness with something will arise and pass it's that impermanent and fleeting and to just see oh ha 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 how long can i just be with that flow get lost in thought be with that flow get lost in thought or sometimes we might get whoa a lot of aversion will come up and we didn't even see it or attachment or a karmic knot or whatever it's like whoa you just keep flowing with this process keep flowing with this process and to see i mean ultimately the balance is to be interested when we can't do it and when there's more controlling and that that it's time to just find a safe place to find the safe anchor and it could be that we just keep coming back to sound or if we're sitting and we really can't be with something stand up be with seeing i often am with seeing bottom of my feet seeing bottom of my feet it's like um you just step on the brake there's this fast stream of life happening and you just slow it down step on the brake and in fact you start discovering through this practice i'm describing as that thinking is actually stepping on the brake getting lost in thought is stepping on the brake there's all kinds of ways we slow down how quickly things are happening and that that's okay that we get interested don't take my word for this that we get interested in this process often when we for many years of practice i think we tend to use our willpower um, in practice and when whether we know it or not there are very hidden agendas and hidden expectations of that we're going to get a lot done or we're going to be this or be that and uh, i've heard a number of people at this retreat talking about how um, they're going through a whole different kind of motivational structure for practice and that they they had felt lost like lost and it's like well what are we losing well we're losing our old ways of practicing the and what's shifting is a deeper motivation so maybe um we we sat and walked and sat and walked and sat and walked um but it was to get something or to get rid of something even if we didn't know it and then it might start to dawn on us that maybe we're learning how to just be to just be vulnerable to just be sensitive and that we're learning to get a relationship with a lot of aspects of life we weren't interested in that we start to see that oh maybe i actually don't have to get rid of anger maybe i can get a relationship with it see that the motivation will start to shift and shift but usually when our motivation is shifting from just pure willpower to just pure being being with whatever is there being with whatever is there it'll feel like um we lose our compass a bit and it and it will take a lot of reassurance that we'll find the new motivation Another way to say this is trusting the unknown versus wanting things to be known. There'll be a way that we might have practiced where we could just go, oh, that's thinking, oh, that's just uh, softness, that's hardness, that it, there's, there's this known, uh, and a, it's like almost like a thunderbolt of clarity, but actually if you start lightening up, and just being more inquisitive there has to be some gentleness and slowness and 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 a wordless it's like a wordless gentleness that might take time it might take an hour for something to emerge and get clear rather than a minute 
And rather than pouncing on it with a kind of um, intense need for clarity, there might be a, a willingness to go through this kind of muddle, these mud, more muddled places where we really don't know. And often when I'm in these places, I just make a soft mental note. I don't know. I don't know. Or not knowing. It's okay. or, or if I'm needing that, I'll be like, it's okay, it's okay. And it, these are the times when I might just walk and just um, be aware of knowing I'm walking and making space for um, the unknown. So for some people, and th this is kind of addressing the people who might be going through these places, it might seem like we're being lazy, you know, or not working hard enough, and that like we should be maybe make the practice a certain way, make it more clear, make it how we it used to be, rather than again, just letting it just be as it is, just letting it be as it is, letting it be as it is. So there's a difference between pushing and lazy and actually being there. You're present, you're there, but you're not imposing an agenda on what's there. Or on a deep level, you're not a, imposing a memory from even five minutes ago of how it should be, or five years ago, five minutes ago. It's like the past is imaginary. Three seconds ago is imaginary. And three seconds from now is imaginary. And, and often I think um, this can often not look as controlled. It can look a little more messy. One, one time um, when we were in Burma at the monastery, we went up one of my, I think my first year there, then second year, but we went up to this monastery um, that was so beautiful. But everything had this vibe of like almost falling apart. Like there'd be an old pottery bowl with water in it that was meant for the birds. But it looked so beautiful, but it had this exquisite sense of, I think they call it in Japanese wabi-sabi, but it's just like old, decaying, but useful, you know, still being used. Or like very old teak floorboards that creaked when you walked in them. Um, the kitchen, just again, very old, but clean and had an order, but, but had that sense of um, not quite um, things that got old weren't replaced at a certain point. The, 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 the monk was letting things decay completely before he would replace it. And it had a, a profound influence on me, those early years of visiting that monastery and just seeing how quiet it was. And it was like letting things arise and pass away, letting and every object kind of arise and pass away in its place. And so beautiful, so, on, so honoring, so respectful. Like It's like I thought, I remember one day, boy, I hope, I can relate to my body like this. You know, I hope we all can, can find that place with each other and all, ever, all beings that we find that place of honoring this arising and passing. And recently, you know, it's been, I don't know, many years of going there now, over 20, maybe next year, 25 years to, to Chazwa Monastery. But this year when we went to see him, he said to me uh, something that was so intense. He said, uh, thank you for being my friend all these years. And I, I just always felt like visiting there, I felt like I always had received so much from getting to just even step into that place. And yet he felt grateful that we were all visiting him every year. 
And it felt very moving to me, just um, the power of making sure you stay connected and visit and not expect, we don't, we don't do anything. We just hang out there a bit. And what, what um, contentment and joy we all have when we get to be together. Sometimes I think if you practice a long time and you get to taste these places of very deep contentment, like, like they might not last that long, but that you know there's this equanimity, this unconditional acceptance of how things are. And you can be vulnerable for a long time and you can be interested in, in controlling. You can be interested in aversion, interested in attachment. And it's so wonderful. And it disappears, right? It's impermanent. And I, I love that place of where you can feel the equanimity going down, the energy going down. And what you usually notice is that for maybe a half an hour, you haven't had aversion to some pain in the body that it comes back and you, you have, well, it's been there and you've been fine with it. And then suddenly there's aversion to it. There's a kind of bittersweet quality to that loss. But if you can appreciate that, it gives us such a sense of honoring uncontrollability. You can see how clearly it's so impersonal. It's unbelievably impersonal. It's just the factors of awakening of calm, concentration, energy, equanimity, interest. They, they just are in flux, not personal. So it's, it's not my equanimity. It's not my contentment. It's not my awareness. So often there are places of doubt in practice that we don't see, that, that we're wanting more to be happening than is happening. And that is a kind of doubt to be very careful of. It's just doubt. And it's insidious. It hurts so much. It's like we're as far away from being okay with what's happening as possible. But it's also a big part of the practice. The more we taste when we can um, see so clearly that you can't control, that ha, 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 our versions come up again. We don't take it personally. It just comes and goes like the sound of the wind, like the sound of a bird. We're okay with it just as it is. And then maybe again, one minute later, the aversion comes, we identify with it, it's mine. And we might have doubt, we want it. We want that equanimity to last longer, but it's impersonal. Probably the energy just went down a little bit. It's okay. When I was young, sort of since conception, it felt that being vulnerable was not okay. Like it was so unacceptable. And I think my father was so afraid of it that he would want to crush it, you know, just get rid of it as soon as possible in me. It's like I represented that to him. And so my conditioning is to think of it as weak and a defeat to to um, to just embody or be, uh, and it's been such a good teaching for me. To this practice has been just like gradually, gradually knowing that vulnerability is the truth, and that we we don't have to be afraid of it. It's the the very moment I walked into my first interview with Sayada Upandita. It was like, wow. He said, Vipassana is knowing anything can happen. And the strength, that's where the strength comes from being connected with that truth.
So there's a the exploration, there's a kind of pure exploration. The motivation can be when we start to understand this and that we see over and over the difference between being connected with what is real and being consumed by a defense. And, and that the practice is also being interested when we get consumed by a defense. It's just, it's usually just like, it's my attachment. It becomes my fear. It, it's like there's a shift from the pure exploration to the defense. And we swing back and forth between these places and get more and more of a relationship with the defense more and more of an understanding of how to work with them so that we need them less. It's revelatory. It's joyful. It's like we can have a joyful interest in seeing the controller and understanding the controller. And usually when we understand the controller, we have great compassion. And part of the, I think, the joy in practice, I've mentioned this, I'm not going to go into it that much, but just again, to remember um, that we can be interested in, in the seemingly mundane, but it's, it's just that, you know, when we have a blind spot with an insect that we don't see it, or we have a blind spot with an animal, um, or we have a blind spot with maybe boredom, it's like we're going to have these blind spots with other people too. It's like anything that we don't have a relationship with in ourselves, we also don't have a relationship in, uh, with others. And that exclusivity, that cutting off and cutting off and cutting off, uh, it's so utterly separate and it hurts so much. So even if it's the tiniest plant, there's a place where I go for a walk almost every day where the, the so-called weeds that have the tiniest, most beautiful flowers. Some are like white stars, some are magenta, feathery things, but they're so small. And they seem like you just, you're supposed to walk over them, right? They're just, they're not grass, but they're in with the grass. And, and the last month or two of being home, because again, I'm home, I'm not flying here and there. I've just seen this um, abundance of these so-called weeds that are just um, spectacular, really. Just like boredom spectacular. So when, again, I'll remind you, when you think there's nothing happening, try to be patient with pace and try to be patient with neutral and calm and um, just see if you can let your attention drop into that and ride it. It's like, it's not a roller coaster. It's not a merry-go-round. <laughs> it's like a little quiet little boat ride without a motor. You know, it's very soft, very gentle. It's developing a taste for what we call mundane. And that refinement, there's a refinement there, like a refine, the breath is very refined. When you go through these boredom places and dull places, the attention will start to get as refined as what's appearing. And this is a never ending process where you might think you've seen everything or heard everything, but actually if you go through these boring places and dull places or confused places, you'll find that you might come up from the other side of it or inside of it into a whole new landscape that's more refined, but very interesting. And I think um, get it being home 
longer than usual. I mentioned this, but I've, I've actually probably planted too many things in my garden um, to, to really take care of or um, explore. Uh, but I've seen it as an experiment and it's taught me so much more about birth and death and not being able to control. Some plants are doing really well. Um, the night before last, I had th these four herb ephedra plants and one astragalus, <laughs> a whole bunch of different kind of herbs that I'm interested in but never had time to grow. And I've been nursing these plants. I can't tell you I come out many times a day where I check them and I just love them so much. And I decided to move them to a sunnier spot because I thought they weren't maybe that doing so well. And um, in one night, they're gone. Like something ate them. Like not just like the roots are gone. Everything's gone. And it's just so interesting. I, it's like I was like, so I think I'm still in shock. Like, wow. It's not that I've had many plants go, but these are the ones I'm attached to, right? These are the ones I've put so much energy into. And there's that teaching, right? Not to be attached to the result of the effort. And it's like, oh, okay, okay. So, and then you know that butterfly cocoon, the monarch butterfly cocoon I told you about? I've been watching it growing and growing. It's not okay. And um, when I looked at it today, I actually ran away. I like ran back in the house and I was like, oh. And um, I just thought, wow, you really couldn't be with that. Like this wasn't like, wow. That's sad. It was more like I ran and then I realized, oh, there's one of my karmic knots. And it's just like when I was five months in the womb, uh, my mother was drinking fit two fifths of alcohol a day. You know, it's like I had fetal alcohol syndrome. It's like she really didn't want to live. And I almost died at five months and I looked at the cocoon and I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle that it would die before it was a butterfly. So I went, I've been going out and just taking pictures and sending it meta and um, it's so healing. I remember when my mom died when I was young, I, I uh, already was taking refuge in some of the uh, old old Chinese poets, exiled Chinese poets. And one of them said, I'm not sure if this was Li Po, but it might have been. And he said, um, an early end is not fate's hurry. An early end is not fate's hurry. And even a being in the womb, right? Even in a cocoon, I felt like now I can just accept that and go there and who knows what will happen, but it's like just be, be with that being until it goes and comes into another form. It's okay. You see, it's just being with, just being with, and then noticing any, any reactions of aversion or attachment we have so we can't be with it. This is what allows us to be with the birth and death of a moment, the birth and death of a difficult emotion, the birth and death of a loved one, the birth and death of a planet, a civilization. It's like getting that sense of um, acceptance. And I wanted to just touch base a little bit more about karmic knots. I brought in a little bit just then, but it's, um, I wanted to talk about the patience and pace we all need with karmic knots because mostly they're the result of some kind of trauma. Often, if we don't call it trauma, that a, a lot of pain, uh, just a lot of pain that 
was overwhelming and often we didn't get help witnessing it or understanding it. Um, and so you can take that range from war, the trauma of war or racism. Racism is so horrific and abuse, physical, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, bullying, abandonment, you know, the neglect, an earthquake, you know, just like the volcano. There's so many different kinds of um, trauma that when we don't know how to work with them, they can be crippling. The fear can be crippling or the anger can be crippling. And so how, how do we deal with them sensitively? And uh, of course, we've all been touching base on this with you through the retreat. Um, but I, I guess I just want to mention that whenever we say this is still happening, the word still, it's still coming up, it's still happening, you know, I can't be with it, it's overwhelming, um, there's usually some kind of karmic knot or ver something very difficult. And we will often have a lot of poisonous disdain towards ourselves, a lot of self-blame that or doubt that we can't be with it, self-hatred. And that this is where motivation purifies. This is really the place where we can see whether we have a hidden agenda of fiddling with it, fixing with it, getting rid of it, um, versus, again, that just being with it, just letting it be, letting, letting the emotion be and learning to be with it, or to know how to back off skillfully. To, this is a, so much of how we teach, all of us, is the training that it takes to, there are times when we just, it comes up, it appears, and we move away. It comes up, we, it appears, we move away. That's strengthening. That's what's so strengthening. That's, without that, you, it's just this, you're just gonna drown over and over and we drown in aversion or we drown in attachment. We don't even see that. It, it just gets so um, difficult to see clearly uh, because we're underwater. And being able to get space, that's what we mean by backing off. So, of course, we talk about, say there's a lot of pain in the body. We say try to find the places in the body that aren't painful. And really, over years, re over years, you, you learn to get the strength of being with sensations that aren't painful or neutral or sound, or stand up, or, or, or be with seeing, or go for a walk. It's like there, that those are, I, I can go into more, but um, you either go to neutral, <laughs> um, you go to other parts of the body that might be pleasant or neutral, or other uh, sights and sounds, or we do the Brahma Viharas, which are pleasant, metta, compassion, mudita, equanimity, the pleasant Brahma Viharas, or we go outside and we find something to be with that's restorative. It can be the sound of a bird. It can be a long walk. It can be a short walk. It can be sitting outside um, looking at a cockroach. It doesn't matter. It's something that gives you joy or happiness or can uh, help you get out of drowning. So the motivation in backing off is not meant to be aversion, and that's where the practice, again, becomes um, the difference between re reinforcing aversion and reinforcing compassion for pain. Going to eat, you can go to eat out of great compassion or out of greed. Same action, totally different motivation. This is, this is um, critical for us to understand. So again, I want to repeat, my conditioning with backing off would be that I was defeated and weak or a failure and learning how it's just the opposite. 
it's just the opposite. It's like learning to be like bamboo in the wind, a strong wind. It's so flexible. The wind will never kill it. And I wanted to bring up um, the gift of being in my neighborhood has been that there are many feral cats and I decided to take this mother cat, I didn't know she was a mother cat. She was just a three month old starving cat that had two daughters. Um, and seeing the level of fear they live in almost all the time, it's like so crippling for them. It's, so, it's such a world of terror. Uh, and this one daughter is the shyest, the most afraid of um, me. And over the years, when I go to feed her, she will stare at me like a real piercing stare to my, you know, very <laughs> deepest heart. She stares at me to make sure that not only am I going to close the screen door, I have to close the glass sliding door. Not only that, when I have accomplished that she wants me to be that, you know, she wants to be that safe. Um, she stares at me until I walk away. <laughs> she she won't let me even be there. And, and watching her, even if I'm doing the dishes for many years, I had to disappear. That was only when she felt safe. And after a few years of this, I would go out and I'd say, oh, you're still afraid. And I would hear myself say the word I teach, right? I say, oh, it was so painful. I'd be like, oh, my, I'm, I'm not accepting her fear. It would be so painful. And I would go, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it was so much fun to watch me accepting her, that level of fear and how long, how long. The mother cat, for example, I'm very close to. She lets me pet her. We, we hang out. But she would never let me pick her up after 10, almost 10 years. But she's been able to move quicker. But this, this one daughter, about six, you know, when I got home from Burma, we had a whole new breakthrough. And I, at 10 o'clock at night, it has to be very late at night, I can stand outside very still, and she'll come over, and she'll walk around the bottom of my legs. And then eventually she touched, she let herself touch my leg, and then she runs as fast as she can to this little scratching um, cradle she has and she just scratches wildly like she gets so over overstimulated she goes crazy scratching and then she looks over at me and that's it like that was a while but now I just want to say last night this cat went around my legs and then she looked up at me and she then she went around and halfway around when she wasn't looking I pet her just once from the top of her head down through all the way to the end of her tail. And um, she made eye contact. She ran to the scratching board, <laughs> scratch wildly. But this is like huge, right? It's such a huge accomplishment. But then I just like, I want to say to all of you, that's how we are. That's how we are with our karmic knots and with, with each other's karmic knots. You know, it's like, we just think, well, why, why does that person still keep doing that, right? It's like, <laughs> we can see very clearly, you know, they could not do that. But it's like, but people are thinking that about us, you know? It's so, it's so vulnerable. Our karmic knots are the most vulnerable. <laughs> so to remember that when we have repeating thought patterns that we're getting sick of or tired of often it's an emotion underneath it that's wanting our attention karmic knots want our attention and so they can often have to get very insistent to the point of like maybe our karmic knot maybe there's a, our system is so shut down our body just aches and it hurts so much and we're so cut off and isolated um, but it's like we have to get practice long enough to even notice that maybe our body's trying to tell us something. And it takes time to be interested because we're so afraid. 
So when we even get a glimpse of like whatever it is, maybe it's rage or anger and there's a repeating thought pattern, but it's a karmic knot and we're afraid of it. And we get just a few seconds of going, oh, anger. It can still feel like it's mine. It might be, per it might be the personal story. We go from the personal to the impersonal with trauma. We go from maybe denial, we go through denial of the story, we, we go through that process. It usually becomes my fear or my loneliness or whatever it is to the impersonal. When we can feel it mindfully and, and have a lot of compassion, that process, then it's just like, oh, it's simply fear, it's okay. It's simply whatever, it's okay. And when we can do that, then we can help somebody else with a karmic knot. Because you know how to to be that delicate. And if, if we don't learn how to back off, we burn out. You know, whether we're doing something out in the world that really needs attention, that's just like calling for our attention, a lot of suffering, or we're doing something inwardly. Um, if we're motivated, I just, you know, summing up by um, trying to get rid of it versus love, you know, the strength of love, the unconditional love. Love infused by wisdom, metta, the strength of compassion, the caring about pain, but infused with wisdom. And the appreciative joy, the just appreciating joy, gratitude for the pleasure and beauty infused with wisdom. Because yet we know if we're attached to joy, we can't be grateful. We just want more. And that deep, unconditional acceptance of how things are, just as they are, without conditions, allows us to be free, peaceful, and act from that place. I just wanted to um, say that it just feels like such a uh, beautiful thing we're all doing together. You know, it's like to, to pull off a silent retreat at home, all of us, so many of us in all parts of the world and uh, learn together, explore together how to liberate ourselves in this context in such hard times is wonderful and moving, very inspiring.
So I'd like to maybe read two poems by Stonehouse. He was a 14th century Chinese hermit, translated by Red Pine. This first one I'm reading because often it's just the encouragement to know that often it's one sense door we learn how to be connected with, sustain the attention with, and to um, relax the attention with, and to learn wisdom with. It, it, it doesn't have to be all the sense doors. It, it leads to us knowing how to practice with all the sense doors. Below high cliffs, I face a thousand mountains. One sense door finds the source. All six relax. White clouds drift. Green water ripples. Beyond movement and stillness, there's another world. And lastly, I've never treasured thoughts of success. I welcome old age and enjoy being free. Grass, shoes, a bamboo staff, the last month of spring, paper curtains, plum blossoms, daybreak dreams. Eternal life and Buddhahood are utter illusions. Freedom from and care is my practice. Last night, the howling pine wind spoke. This is something the deaf can't hear. Let's sit for a minute together. So it's time for walking or whatever you do at this time, and then um, the chanting, metta, sit, take care.